All right. Tuffy Bloom Carroll, Board of Education, the order of this planning session. Roll call, please. Mr. Abbott. Mr. Bratton. Yes. Here. Mr. Johnson. Present. Mr. Mellis. Present. Ms. Parker. Present. Did you hear that lady sing the national anthem of the NBA? No. It was it was bad. Oh really? She kept trying to change what octave she was singing in. Well, D, consider approval of agenda. Does anybody have any, see any changes that we need to make or add to? Mark, you, you had mentioned, uh, I mentioned safety. Sa safety, but that's yeah. that's going to fall under uh, some personnel and some staffing and some finance all combined. Okay. Some things that's we want to talk about that kind of fall under that. The, the one thing I had in regards to it is has the uh, BCEA. Have they got the calendar to us? I know they're supposed to get it to us by like February 1st. Yeah, that is actually already, that the we did a two-year calendar. Oh, you did, okay. So the next year's calendar has been approved already okay. by the previous right. board. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's right. Okay, if seeing no changes then, could we have a um, roll call, please? Oh, how about a motion? So moved. Second. Okay. Second. Now how about a roll call? Ms. Parker? Yes. Mr. Bryan? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Mellis? Yes. E, planning session. That's you. All right. I um, don't want to spend a ton of time on this, but I, it's something that I want to keep moving on, uh, something that we were hoping to accomplish uh, this school year. And we're getting to the point where publicly we're going to have more and more information going out. And uh, I talked to the board, last school board, and a lot of you had attended uh, the board meetings in, in the fall. But one thing we wanted to look at was our um, our mission statement, our vision statement, and our values, our beliefs. And, um, you know, it's kind of uh, our relationship, or my relationship with the board, Travis's relationship with the board, obviously is, is mutual. I obviously work for this, the board and, and to carry out your will, but also there are times where you, I think you need me to provide you with information and to help you make decisions in that process. So one thing that our administrative team felt that we needed was, um, you know, we needed some basic principles, what we believe in, and then develop a plan uh, to accomplish those things. And one thing that I really felt um, going back over my entire career, but especially here at Boone Carroll in over 20, now 20 years as a coach, teacher, um, you know, building administrator. Award winner. <laughs> no, that's what, whatever they are. But um, I have to throw but th there were there's times where I feel like there's a core set of values that I really believe in, and um, it really starts with relationships with each other and with our community and uh, among our staff and our students, um, in that communication piece and making sure that people feel that we're being transparent and they have the information and they understand why decisions are made as best as possible. You know, I really wanted to focus on that relationship building and that communication piece and be positive even with people that disagree with you um, in the decisions you have to make. So with, when we look at our kind of core principles, uh, we focused on relationship building and communication. And then obviously there's uh, just as important, you know, but in order to really reach students, we have to be able to, in order to teach them and have them learn and reach their highest level, we have to make sure that we are building those bridges, those relationships, and then students will want to learn for you um, and work through their difficulties if they, if they know that somebody cares about them. Uh, so that teaching and learning component was also one of the, the core principles. And then being fiscally uh, responsible with our taxpayers' money. Um, you know, we all live here, uh, every single one of us in this room tonight lives here and pays income tax and uh, property tax. And we want to make sure that we are um, being diligent in every dollar we spend and that you know, we're making good decisions all the way from the classroom level all the way up to the Board of Education with how money is spent. And I think our district has a pretty good record of that. Um, something we certainly want to continue is that fiscally conservative approach while maintaining excellence. And then the facilities issue, it is clear that no matter how you look at our facilities plan, and we've adopted a plan and we're going to be on the ballot to try to accomplish this, um, we have to make sure that we are pursuing safer and more appropriate learning environments for our students. That is our biggest issue in our district right now. A lot of districts would love to have that as an issue, that that is their biggest issue. 
our, our kids are doing a great job in the classroom. We need to improve with teaching and learning, but to have our biggest concern be to improve facilities, um, you, you know, there's a lot of districts that would like to have that issue, but we have nine grade levels that need to be addressed, and we're working towards that, and hopefully we, we take a step closer to solving some of those issues in May when we're at the ballot. Um, but with that, the reason I said that, I wanted to remind you of some of these core principles that I wanted to help provide direction with and also have the board direct me at the same time. Um, and, and then when, when you look at the board's goals, it's handout 1.3. Um, there's nothing wrong with these goals. The board, the board typically has a set of goals every year. and They've been rolled over from year to year, and that's because you don't always accomplish your goal in a year. Some, some of these things take many, many years to accomplish, and that's, that's just part of the process that we're involved in. And things can only move so fast. We only meet monthly. We, we really have learned to live on a month-to-month -month schedule mm -hmm. uh, throughout the course of the year in terms of making progress. But, you know, I, I guess, you know, does the board want to have some discussion about the goals? Do they want to simply change these by, you know, changing the year on them for 2018? Or would the board like to discuss and draft something that may be a bit more concise, but focus on some of the same areas? Or would you want to look, as, look at our guiding principles and do those become goals? Or do you take a little bit of that and turn those into your goals? So the, the, final, the final thing that you know, I kind of started off my comment with was that to talk to you about at the beginning of the year that our mission, vision, and values is um, I believe in what it says, but it's very long. And people, not one staff member in our district could even tell me what our mission statement was this year, what our vision statement was, and what our core values are. There were 13 different sentences plus multiple paragraphs above and below mm -hmm. what our core set of values are. And most district in today's world, uh, you know, in, in some ways it's sad, but we live in a much faster world where people want concise, to the point information, just tell me and let me make a decision and move on. I felt like we needed to take what we believe in as a district, talk to our community, get input from our community, and then shape you know, what would become a more concise mission, vision, and value statement. So in this process throughout the year, and I've shared information, I've shared surveys with you, um, administrative meetings have taken place, been out to the buildings and talked to the staff, um, but what we have drafted is something that I would like to propose. It's not that you, the board formally votes to accept these, but it's the direction that I think our team would like to go, and I want to make sure that the school board is literally on board and supports this, and that you feel that we are headed in the right direction. But based upon the feedback from our staff and community, the mission statement that we got, and remember, you want it to be something that anymore will fit on a fit on a, uh, a bracelet or fit on a t-shirt, you know, something that people can remember and is impactful. And our community believes that our focus, our mission every day should be on our students, preparing them for the future, and that should be our focus. So when you look at our mission statement, it's, it's a fragment, but we go our students, their futures, our focus. And you may look at the middle and say, futures with an S, but yes, each individual student in today's world, instruction is much more individualized, and not every kid fits into the one or two pathways for their life, and you have, we, our job is to make sure that we're connecting with students and helping them, finding out what their interests are and helping them develop and reach their goals. So when we look at our mission, what we would like to propose is our mission statement, because we would like to start getting this out there on letterhead, literature, mailers going out this spring, that our focus as a district is our students, their futures, our focus. So I wanted to propose that, yeah, obviously have some discussion in just a second. And then I'm gonna jump down to the vision statement. You know, this is our, our North Star. It's what, we're, what we hope to accomplish. I'm not saying we're there yet, but it's what we're trying to reach for. And when you look at our vision statement, our, what our community believes we should be is that we should be a model school district for excellence in student success, opportunities, and safety, exemplified through our commitment to our students' educational experiences. These mission statements and vision statements were taken from feedback mm -hmm. and pieced together, all right, from, from what our community said. Um, I do believe that we should be, uh, right now we're on the cusp in a lot of ways of being the model school district. A lot of school districts are coming here to visit 
and visit our classrooms and see what our teachers are doing. They're asking us what curriculum we're using, what programs we're using, why we use that. People are starting to take notice that, you know, hey, who are they chasing? That work, you know, how can they improve student achievement? So we want to be a model, just not in academic success, but lots of opportunities. And we do believe in a well-rounded education. There's an importance on STEM. Uh, learning has become more and more popular throughout the state and even STEAM. And there's areas that we can do that, and there's career tech programs that we've added in the middle school and high school, uh, and, and that exposure for students at the career centers. But our opportunities also extend beyond the curriculum and also into athletics, into the arts. Um, you know, we've added middle school plays that it used to be a district play every other year. We felt like we could get more students exposed to the arts by offering a middle school play as well. Um, so we have band opportunities, choir, uh, visual arts, um, a lot of different things are being done. A lot of great things are being done in our district. So opportunities is more than just in the classroom. It's also athletically and in co-curricular and extracurriculars. And then safety. Obviously, this is a, a hot topic right now as a tragic reminder of what happened in Florida a week ago. Um, but safety has to be a priority for us. I think we have to include that in our, in our vision uh, to improve the safety, to do the best we can, um, and, and look for ways to improve and how to allocate resources, how the board wants to allocate funds in, in those areas. Um, and then, you know, that, that is all great to say, but are we going to exemplify that in our actions as a board, um, as a superintendent, as administrators, teachers? Are we actually going to carry out what we believe through our actions every day? So our commitment to our students' educational experiences through our actions, I think, is critical. Just not, just not you know, throwing words out to say how, how great we think we are. Uh, we, we need to actually not say that, but actually be so in, in what we do every day. So the community also responded when you look at the core values that um, they list character, community, excellence, uh, respect, and responsibility as some of the top um, statements um, in terms of what, what we should value. But several people also responded that integrity was listed when you could just submit um, any adjective um, for what kind of district you want to be. So, um, you know, I, I think including that in there is fine. Sometimes groups of three or groups of five work better. But I wanted to bring this to you because I feel like we've done what we can do at this point, and it's time for me to present it to you, and it's time to either kind of put this part to bed and say, you know, we can get this out there on some of our documents and on our website and we've got these big signs in our school buildings and right now people walk by them because they're too long to read and, exactly. and, and, and we can and we can use the same frames but we want to maybe adjust the purple on this a little bit but um, we want to get this printed and use those frames you know, I could tell it wasn't purple and I have yeah that. yeah it's a little bit different so we gotta uh, I'll have Jennifer adjust that but this is what I'd like for you guys to chime in on, discuss, yeah, I mean, say I, yay, nay, go back to the drawing board, scrap it. I mean, I agree with you totally because I mean, everything that's out there. I mean, it's literally like three paragraphs long. I mean, you, some, yeah. you need something simple, concise, and to the point. Mm -hmm. um, I like what you started with. Obviously, built around that. Uh, there was a couple things in regards to like <clears throat> the board's goals, you know, for 2018, um, and even up here on, you know, when we talk about the financial stewardship mm -hmm. you know if you wanted to condense that down I think that financial the fiscal stewardship falls back on the school board overall mm -hmm. that could be one of our goals obviously mm -hmm. you know we're, we're going with the with the ballot issue coming up right um, in May you know to do the best plan as possible uh, you know save taxpayers money built around that I think that could be one that that's tied in with the facilities as well for our goals mm -hmm. uh, built around that as well in the community and the communication yeah. um, you know, I think those that those are the couple that I actually follow through, and I our, our job is to you know relay and you know meet with the community if they have questions built around what we're doing with our school district. Right. Um, from that standpoint, I, I think the existing board goals mm -hmm. for 2017, I think they're appropriate. I mean, obviously, curriculum focused, facilities focused, and uh, that communication piece. Those are three good goals. Um, you know, Matt, Mark, Stacy. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys would like to work on drafting something or 
making some editing changes. Um, you know, I think in the past, uh, board president has kind of submitted something, we come back to another planning session, um, look at those, revise those if needed. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm fine with whatever the board mm -hmm. wants to do with their goals, but I think it's important that uh, people do know what's, in, what's important to the school board. Um, you know, and if they need updated, we can update them. If it simply means uh, changing the year and these are still focal points for this board, that is fine. I just wanted to give the board an opportunity mm -hmm. to, since we have three new board members, um, to look at these and have some discussion. There's an interesting article in the paper, I guess it was Monday, uh, talking about vocational education and not that we're vocational school, but since you mentioned some of the things that, that we've implemented here, mm -hmm. uh, they were saying that Eastland Vocational and Fairfield get phone calls, you know, almost weekly saying, we've got openings in these areas, what do you have for people who will be graduating? I mean, they just can't they, get them adult, quickly enough. Their and, adult and education adult too, program I mean. is huge. They offer a lot of training. A lot of people realize they're yeah, 19 Yeah, that parking lot was pretty full. My, my yeah. classroom was right next to Eastland there at Grove yeah. They offer a lot of evening classes, and a lot of people realize, boy, you know, maybe in high school I should have checked out some of the mm -hmm. career center programs right. a little bit closer. but. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they offer vocational education is huge. I, I personally, I do believe that college is not for everybody. I don't believe no, that people should is. go spend one hundred twenty thousand dollars and become, you, you know, just uh, you know, a, a slave to their debt. Um, right. If there's another avenue to enter the workforce and make good money, um, I see a lot of people will just go through college and not necessarily know what they want to do and spend a lot of money in that process, you know. And Change your majors a few times. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, career tech education at the middle school with robotics and we are, we're starting a pre-engineering program uh, for seventh graders uh, next year that'll be proposed. Um, you know, we're, look, we're looking at some more uh, engineering kind of pathways at the high school as well with a few things, but we actually do receive funding now for family and consumer sciences considered career tech. Um, our ag program obviously is a career tech program, but then the kids have 16 current programs at the career centers to access, and they're actually adding a couple additional programs there as well at both Eastland and, and Fairfield. So I, I think the state and the country is starting to realize that you know the, the, the path of forcing everybody into college isn't always what's best for the manufacturing sector, and, no, and uh, we have to have skilled workers as well. Uh, college is right for the right person. You know, but um, so so I don't know if if in your you know in your goals, um, you, you know if you guys you know Matt and, and Stacy if you guys uh, want to jump in here as well. But you know I'm perfectly fine with what we have, and I can let Jennifer know, and we can continue to keep those on the website. If you would like to work on these and maybe discuss at a planning session in March, um, maybe, maybe bring a few ideas. Um, that's an option as we could, well. We could do that. You know, so just kind of wanted to give you guys an op opportunity. I don't want to purport to write one up and make changes myself as board president just because I know I would probably leave something out that uh, mm -hmm. sure. I, wouldn't want, I wouldn't want. I mean, I, I, like what, like, I like what's there. I mean, I, like I think the there. other one we just need to add is fiscal stewardship. Okay. Around that. I, just, I think, you know, we're elected, you know, by the community. Right. Okay. And, you know, our goal is to do you know, <laughs> make a lot of decisions that are f fiscally responsible. Right. right. And, and these are these goals are consistent with kind of the principles that yeah, I felt. Exactly. If I needed to provide some direction, th these were areas that were important mm -hmm. to me. The, the one goal that Rod is mentioning that is kind of missing from the board anywhere, um, I believe, is, you know, showing that fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. and, and doing the best we can with our dollars. So I don't see anywhere that that's addressed in the goals and... If you want to put together a couple thoughts and then bring it back mm -hmm. to a planning session, um, I think that would be good. I mean, if you just look, if you've just been at Pickerington North, and not to pick on them since there's, but right. there's no one, no one here to you know uh, argue with me. But I, I was there for, uh, I helped out with voting uh, one year there as, mm -hmm. a, as a worker, and uh, someone of the taxpayers, well, I guess he thought I lived in the air, lived in Pickerington, and he said, "Oh, this is what my taxes are paying for," and. You know, compared to this building, and this building is nice, but compared, I mean, that place is a Taj Mahal. I mean, just walking in where the where the uh, auditorium is, what have you. It's yeah. Like, I yeah. mean, and comparing that building 
to pick center, it's like, ooh. Yeah, and it's all, yeah. it's all what your community will support. Will support. You know, and communities are different. So knowing your terrain, I think, obviously is important. But why don't we... Um, I think if I lived there and my kid was in pick center, I think maybe he kind of got yeah. gypped somewhat. You know, like what, as far as buildings I think my comments would be consistent with, if, if as a school district, these are what the guiding principles ooh. are, I would expect the board cool. to have matching or similar it doesn't have to be identical but mm -hmm. i mean obviously you're taking the approach of the entire that's what we're here to support mm -hmm. i think is that so i i would agree with ron on adding something around mm -hmm. fiscal stewardship or something and then relationship building community yeah, and i just i just want to make sure i mean i, I try I to provide some guidance mm -hmm. um you know i i believe this board is good that in trusting that you know we've been the people working here have been educators in the classroom or uh, we've worked our way up through, um, you know, listening to our teachers, our administrators, um, but also that goes two ways. That, you know, we have to listen to our school board. So I don't want you to think that I want to try to force any thought upon the board, but I wanted to provide a direction with these principles to our administrative team about what do we value, what, what are everyday interactions, what's important to us. So that's what I tried to do with the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. And if this board wants to, you know, look at their goals, and make sure that they're pretty much in line right now. Yeah. But if you guys, you know, and, and whether it's board president or vice president, draft something to bring, to submit to Jennifer, and then we can talk about it at the March planning session and make any revisions that need to be made, I'm okay with that. I mean, but, I just... But I would say, on the flip of that, as a consumer, if you will, of the school district, I mean, yeah. my kids all attend here, right. that these are the type of things that I want to see from not necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm flipping my yeah. hat and saying as a parent of students that attend this, this is the type of thing I would want to see. So, mm -hmm. you know, you guys are obviously putting that together. I think, mm -hmm. like to me, uh, these would be the values that now if I flip to the board that I would want represented. So okay. I, I like what we have here. I think, yeah, maybe there's, uh, like you said, like you mentioned, a read through of this with some suggested edits now, maybe next time or yeah. Yeah, okay. email. Whatnot. Okay. Okay. So we'll, I'll bring I'll bring that back in March. I'll remind you okay. as we get closer. Well, and Joe may have different input too. Since yeah. He's not here, so. Okay. Um, how do you, how do you stand on this right now with this draft, Sean? Um, I, I'm I'm really good with it. Um, okay. Our, our team likes it. They said run with it, take it to the board. I like it personally. So, that's why I'm asking. I like the word integrity. I mean, I think a lot of it's, times it's different than character. It's close, yeah. but it's different. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I just wanted to, again, make sure that you, the board was aware of all of that. Um, and it's something that would have been harder to say about 25 years ago. Yeah, at the school district, absolutely. Um, okay, moving to, to section two. Um, Travis, I'm finance, I'm going to let you kind of take that and go through the spreadsheets. Okay. Uh, the first thing is really, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I think it's important especially for new board members to have kind of an understanding on where we stand with, quite frankly, as our largest expenditure salaries and the decisions that you're going to be making in the upcoming months that don't only impact next year financially, but exponentially impacts us for years to come when we look at, um, you know, again, our largest expenditure, which is our salary. Uh, the Educational Service Center of Fairfield County does a salary comparison each year. Um, this was just uh, distributed to us, and as is customary, we'll, uh, we'll give a copy to the board. And if, I want to preface it by saying I think Mr. Hahn agrees is we're not going to base all of our recommendations and our increases or whatnot on what other schools are doing, but I think it does um, it, it does bode well for us to know where we stand competitively mm -hmm. and yeah. the ability for us to retain you know uh, our, our staff, uh, which certainly we want to do that. Because we lost four in this building just. This year, exactly. This year, so. Exactly. So uh, certainly, the, we need to be cognizant of uh, where we stand in the in the county. Uh, the first page, and, and again, I know you were given this during your new, new member board orientation. With our teachers union, uh, those salary increases are all established through a negotiations type environment, uh, and those have been set through eighteen nineteen for us, uh, as you can see highlighted there, starting on page eight. Um, the salary percentage changes on the hard copy, Mr. Mellis. Um, most of the other districts have not negotiated or their contracts are expiring this year. Um, so as we get more information, we can fill that in. Uh, the next two pages 
are the only positions uh, that do not currently have a salary schedule. And when I talk salary schedule, I mean there's a base, either hourly pay or uh, salary, and that everything else is driven by a multiplier. Uh, so the, the multiplier, the only thing that changes is the base. Uh, the multipliers stay the same, the steps stay the same, um, but with the superintendent, the treasurer, typically those amounts are only changed by employment contracts. So they're, they're stepped out in the employment contracts uh, when, those are, when those are considered. In each of these, I had Jennifer go through and sort it by just, again, highest to lowest. If, instead of looking at every number, just kind of look at the yellow there and you can kind of see, uh, especially when you get to the steps, uh, where we stand. Uh, if you go to the page 12, or I'm sorry, 11 of 20, uh, that's our special ed director. Again, we do have a salary schedule for that position. Uh, so as the employee advances on through years with Bloom Carroll, um, they are placed on the next uh, commensurate step uh, based on their experience. Uh, the principals, uh, page 12, again. Travis, what is, what is max? I mean, what, what, so I assume it's zero, 10 years. For, for the administration, it's um, 15. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay. And that's how ESC kind of laid it out because certainly it's, and that's the other thing, it's different for each district and the steps are different. But there are not steps at every yeah. level, though. There, right. there is until like step eleven, then it goes yeah. thirteen. Similar to the teacher yeah. schedule. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, I think um, a lot of times the public over thinks there's a step increase every year. Mm -hmm. right. and, and we can get more into that as we kind of look at the schedules individually, maybe at a future planning session to look at you know some of the increases. But for now, I just want to kind of give you a baseline idea of again, if you just kind of follow the yellow, and, and really it's it's kind of holds true throughout all of these positions. You'll see it starts either to the mid part, mid range, or even maybe toward the higher end of the county. And it does kind of step down, quite frankly, uh, the further that you move across the schedule. And certainly there's some varying factors there, but you know that, that may be a factor when you kind of look at you know, our ability to, to keep qualified and, and good staff. Uh, the teacher salaries, um, page 13 of 20 on the electronic copy. Um, we have four, um, we have the bachelor's, we have a, uh, 150 hours, which is the five year. We have a master's and we have a master's plus 15. So that's a master's degree plus 15 yeah. uh, additional hours. We do not have a master's plus 30. Travis, why, why is that? Because I looked at this and we're the only school district it looks like that doesn't have that. Looks that way now. It, yeah, it's, it's, I was surprised to see it's that. Changed, um, it wasn't it that has. way a few years ago. Yeah. I, I know during, uh, I got to... Three years ago, I got to participate with Travis and Mark and board president at the time on negotiations. And the teachers in the bargaining sessions, they don't, they haven't focused on the end salary. Yeah, they focused on it they up didn't. front. I, I was surprised they didn't. So, right. um, we but we are currently the only district without the masters plus thirty. That's, I mean, that's good to know because I mean traditionally I mean we've had teachers here that have gone the course of their and we have career that, and I'm so it's, surprised it's that no one ever brought that up especially the way STRS works with right. the five ad five years five year average and no cola once you've retired yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah that's one of the surprises probably, probably, probably don't no I don't you don't no. how many people didn't go last year with that that's a good question I don't have that off the top of my head. Um, it's 10, probably, it's probably, I'd say ten. What was it's probably question? a good. How, how many, many would have thirty have hours above a master's? It's yeah. Our, our staff. I think the main reason why they have focused. Um, I don't know how the union. The union would have to speak to this. Um, the focus has been early on on the pay scale, and I think it's because honestly, when you look at our the age of our staff overall, there's a lot of people probably in the first fifteen years <laughs> of their career compared to the last fifteen. Do we have anybody with a PhD? Not, no. No. Yeah. Um, we will have one here real soon. Is that Our right? school psych is finishing hers. Yes. Yeah. Oh, but yeah. no teacher. No. no. Well, and the trouble is, I mean, in a way, there's a trouble with that. If you, we had a, someone I talked with uh, uh, took a sabbatical and went, to, you know, took more hours at high State and came within, you know, just having the uh, all the dissertation thing you could put, you know. If he, Send off some mail or something, but the trouble is, if you would get that PhD, then you're going to go back to probably a lower salary than you're making as teaching because you're going to have no experience as the curriculum coordinator. 
and go back to. Maybe you're making sixty thousand as a teacher. You may go back to. Oh, to go into administration. Oh, you're going into administration. There, there, I just. I mean, that's what most people yeah, probably yeah, There do becomes a point of no return. There comes a point of no return. Yeah. Just like once teachers have ten or fifteen years, and it's like, do you really want to move? Because it's like. Well, you, you're going to work more days, you're and you're going to make less per day yeah. when you go back to step zero on the administrative so. scale. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I give them a lot of credit. I mean, I, I look at this now, and I mean, there for a while, I mean, we were one of the lowest paid school districts across the board. Mm -hmm. when it does, so, I mean, from a competitive standpoint and losing good educators, I think this is a good model. You know, yeah. we're on the right path, at least, to be you know, competitive. But keep in mind, some districts, obviously, they they don't have the master's plus 15. Yeah. You know? So you wait a lot, you wait a lot, obviously wait longer to get to that, but yeah. And if you look at the and if you look at the top three districts there, Pickering, and Lancaster, and Canal Winchester, mm -hmm. are all much larger than oh, us. Yeah, and if you, yeah. if you throw them out, then we're pretty much right right there. I'm not saying you should. I'm just saying, right. of course, yeah. we lost a teacher at Pickerington, so yeah, you, you, have, you have to compare apples to apples, <coughs> yeah. right? But I mean, yeah. as far as the rest of the county goes, yeah. you know, do we do exit interviews with those teachers? We we do have an exit <coughs> interview form. I, I haven't had any exit yet. You know what I mean? I'm just wondering, do we have a general yeah. understanding of why teachers are leaving? Is it purely salary? Is well, it, I mean, there's obviously I, I know this. I, I know other. our turnover traditionally has been low, um, it's good and, and, and it's because it's because uh, people know. Well, even administrators have given up a lot of money elsewhere to work here, and there's something to be mm -hmm. said for peace of mind and really good kids and really good families to work with. And I think that's what keeps people here. I don't know, I'm not saying that's fair, that you know you should keep a salary low because of that, but people know that if they go elsewhere for more money, typically it's going to involve more issues that they're not always dealing with here. Right, um, it would have certainly been the, the growth the, Some of the about. teachers that we did lose here recently, um, they were for family reasons. Um, they were traveling too far, they had children, yeah. you know, they, they wanted to be closer. One to, of them just went for more money though, basically. Yeah. Yeah, and that, that hasn't been a that's, frequent occurrence, a but you know, this past year we, we did have that happen. Yeah. Um, the from four, page fourteen on the rest are our classified positions, which are of course hourly, but still again uh, able to compare apples to apples when you look at this uh, comparison. Uh, it's very similar in the um, the index. There are, there's not an educational component to the index, but there's still a years of service compare, um, uh, component to the index uh, that we do follow and offer a commensurate experience when someone comes to us uh, with, with a little bit of experience. So we have the aid, which is separated out, uh, and then all of the other uh, classified positions that we have. I, I took out some of the ones we don't. Um, again, kind of a similar, if you just kind of look at the yellow instead of Strictly looking at the dollar amounts, kind of a similar uh, path or pattern uh, as you look at the various positions, entry versus uh, maxing out. Um, to make sure I understand too, maxing out is there? The top so I'm looking. I don't know. Pick one. Yeah. Custodian, nineteen dollars and forty-seven cents. That is the max that mm -hmm. will ever be pushed, or in, will there? Is there in, cost of living adjustments? No. That, Any questions? Um, again, normally April will be the time where you'll see contract extensions. You'll see um, increases if uh, if recommended for administration and classified positions. Again, the teachers have uh, already already been uh, signed uh, through the negotiation process. And that for negotiation year. would occur in summer of 2019. Yes. Yeah. 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 20, it expires. The contract expires June 30th of 19. <clears throat> Travis, how many um, retire, rehire teachers do we have in the district? 
Good question. Um, I would say we're at about 10. Does that sound right? It might be a little yeah, high. Maybe a little high. Not, not over 10, I'll say that. Yeah. yeah. And we have 108 teachers. Mm -hmm. I'd say under 10%. We, we have uh, classified staff that are also retire, rehire through SERVs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you will, you will also see those on April separated out as they're on a series of one year, mm -hmm. one year contracts. There's no more than one year contracts for previously retired employees. <coughs> While we're there, uh, one question I had in regards to that when I looked at the uh, ne negotiated agreement on that. Mm -hmm. So if they if they do retire and they rehire, is it is it a given or do they have to you know do you have to get recommendation from you for that? It would have to be a recommended from okay. the principal superintendent. Okay, or, I just want to make sure. Or supervisor if it's custodian or cook or. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do they get through a process for that? Is it so? Is it an open interview process or is it just simply we're retiring? Typically, right? there's. We'll jump in here. There's typically not an yeah. open interview. It's I'm not the. the um, is it the request then? I assume of the teacher. It, it is it, the, the hey, teacher. The teacher requests it. The principal obviously provides a ton of input to me if this is something they feel <coughs> is in the best interest of our students. Um, you know, at that point they'll make a rec recommendation to me. I make the recommendation to the board. The positions are not posted typically. Um, they uh, they do not interview for the position again. Um, that that is something that we're we're not going. I mean, most of those teachers at that point of their career, in the past, have been on a continuing contract. Mm -hmm. um, if, if they want to retire, rehire, obviously they give up that continuing contract. And now there's language in our negotiated agreement where they go on a one year, and after one year, they that contract can lapse. And the, we don't have to act on it, and we just don't rehire them again, and then they, they would not be employed in their second year. Okay, so sometimes you know a staff member has to make that decision: is it in their best interest also to give up that continuing contract status and retire, rehire? But then once they're rehired, they're on a one-year contract, which is year to year, where their continuing contract may have protected them more. Right. So That's we, okay. we we haven't we haven't. Um, Posted those jobs in the past. They haven't been considered vacant positions according to the the, the, the union representation or, or us. Our intent is if we're going to move in that direction that they're going to fill that. There's some benefits to the a lot of benefits to the district. Uh, some people have mixed feelings. You could argue either side of the retire rehire issue. Um, oh yeah, we had one board member that never. Yeah, and and you know. So, so what is the the? They go I, to step if I am five. A teacher, I'm not a teacher. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, what, what's my benefit? Well, why do I do that? Your, the benefit for the teacher is you're drawing your retirement yeah. check plus and, and your salary. Yeah. So you it's, a, it's, it's a reduced a salary, but a certain yeah. when you add the two together, it's higher than what you would make simply being on step 25. Which I assumed was the right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, our <coughs> teachers, our retired teachers, after their first limited contract, so after they retire, they get a one-year contract. If we act on that, again, to re-employ them for another one-year contract, at that point, in order to non-renew a retire rehire teacher, we actually have to take action once they're in their second year or their third year or their fourth year, unless they just decide to resign and, you and, know, that, they, and, and, and not pursue The second it. year of that job's never posted, correct? It's, it's, correct. Still, it's still not posted. Okay. Yeah. Have there been anybody, and I don't know this from, well, I, I've been on the board, but maybe it just never you know, came to us, but has there been anybody who wanted to be retire rehire that didn't get it? Yes. yes. Okay. Yeah. And that is a, is that a school policy that we do not open the position up? It's or not considered a, a new position, or so we, we haven't opened it up. Um, past practice with the union, the union hasn't. But seen I it. guess maybe my quote maybe is it is it in the union contract? Yes. yes. Or yeah. is it, it's okay. spelled out specifically when we have to post a job? Yes. When you have to post yes. a job. So okay. okay. Yeah. So if you ultimately say we're not reading. Hiring you, exactly. then, post. It's then you would post. That's now, right. what if that? I think it's May 11th in there. I think it's when it is. So what if the teacher says, okay, then I'm not retiring? Yeah. Yes. That's, yeah. that's, that's okay. So that's okay. their prerogative yeah. at that point. Especially okay. if they're on a continuing contract. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Absolutely. The, the reason I asked for that is, and I mean, and we'll get to enrollment here soon, but I mean, to come in at five-year salary, I mean, if we have to add a staff member because we have to have enough, you know, <laughs> 
teachers or the class size based on their contract. I mean, I think K through five, it, it, it doesn't mention the amount of classes, but 170 for six middle school, they consider six in the contract through 12. I mean, at some point, if you're, if you got, you know, five, you know, 10, let's say, in a five year step, I mean, you can add two staff members there, where if you open the job up, you can actually get a first year teacher and save money. I'm looking at ways that we can save the district yeah. money. And, and where it catches us, so like, and Travis knows this, um, he probably it cringes a little bit when he has to do it, but when they retire, they receive their severance. So you don't save anything the first year? First year. Okay, all right. You yeah. pay their severance. Even though they're going from step 30 to 5. Right, with sick days. That's severance. Sick, you're talking sick, not yes. Yes. Oh, sick. Sick, yeah, it's yeah. Okay. Case, yeah. I was like, they get a percentage of their sick days paid at their daily rate. You know, it's it make, it more than makes up the savings that you get. From going for the but max and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now year two, it's now you're saving. Right, right, right. But yeah. and they, they do progress up to step ten. So they start at five and then they go up to ten. They say that ten's the max. Yeah. yeah. We have some at the max though, don't we? We have some at the max and who've getting been rehired as a retiree. Yeah, we have several at ten. Um, I think we have one that we're, I think for graduation, we really need to be careful with the seating because we have one person who isn't getting around all that well, I hear these days, and they about fell last year in graduation. I had to grab his arm. That's why I put you there. No, no, no. Well, it, it, I'm glad to do it. I just mean, I, and that was all I could do with one arm to hold him up, so yeah. I need to move them much closer <laughs> to the microphone. Okay. Um, any, any questions for Travis on the salary schedules? Mm -hmm. Travis, any other finance stuff you want to go over at this point before we kind of jump into? I was just going to explain real quick, and then I can I can turn it over. But just on the, on the wish list, just just from a financial dollar standpoint. Um, and again, I I apologize for the small print, but it was just trying to get all this on. One page. You can enlarge it on the surface yeah, a little bit there. Sixteen and seventeen. Um, the, the wish list itself, just so, just so we're aware, is sorted two ways. Um, we um, we asked for it from each department and each building. So as we got them in, we sorted it by uh, either department or building. And then we also have sorted it as you would see it on the monthly financial report or the five-year forecast, depending on the object expenditure that it would fall under. So on page two, uh, line... I think I left the grid lines in, yeah, 103, 104, 105, and 106. You see the total broken down by how much of it would show up as personnel, how much of it would show up as a purchase service, supplies, curriculum, and then what the majority of it is in this capital outlay. So it kind of serves two purposes. One, shows what each department and uh, building has requested, but also as we kind of look at a permanent improvement levy, and, and we look at these, mm -hmm. and, I, and I'll give the credit to our staff and our principals. I th think they do a diligent job of producing these, and a lot of thought goes into it. And I think as you look at through all of these requests, I think they're all justifiable, um, you know, as we look at what they face on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, a, a, one, uh, a permanent improvement levy that will raise approximately four hundred fifty to 500000 certainly is needed as you look at, you know, the requests that fall into the capital outlay category which is direct uh, expenditures that can be taken out of a permanent improvement levy. Uh, so certainly as information is presented from the levy perspective, again, not looking at vote yes or vote no, but strictly financial uh, in, in information, we can point to this list of uh, items that can be funded through a permanent improvement levy. Um, as you look at uh, column E and F, and then I, I can turn it over, uh, we, can, we can look at each individual item. Where it says in forecast additional, that's the amount that currently is contained within the forecast um, for next fiscal year. So if I we look at personnel. I'm missing something here. <clears throat> Travis, does personnel go, including go benefits on an average? average? No. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry, yes. Because uh, yes. that's the big kicker in a lot of Yes. Okay. okay. What's this? Okay. Oh, there I, I didn't yeah. see those. I was looking yeah, up so here thinking it was the whole column. Yeah. Is there a mark that tells us which ones are in the forecast? Yes, it, it, it says, in, it should, it should say in forecast additional. So you see I the see total is 1,874,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that's, that's then broken down by how it falls into the object. Yeah. So we're over right now. And again, this just kind of shows you as a baseline, if you would decide to add all the positions that are contained within the, um, the wish list, 
we would be over what's currently in the forecast by $182,400, that far column to the right, uh, because currently we, we have two positions, two certified positions and one classified position, including benefits, as Mr. Johnson requested, uh, which is a good question. Um, if, if we did, and certainly we'll move into the staffing um, uh, discussion here in section three, but the biggest area here for this wish list um, before we get into staffing is the capital outlay. Yeah. We currently have $630,935 in our capital outlay line item on the five-year forecast. Mm -hmm. And this is the only thing that doesn't go from year to year. So it's a zero-based budget. So it doesn't have a, an item that was mm -hmm. in there last year. We're adding a percent or anything. This basically starts at zero each year. And we approve so items on this wish list that, that, that makes up the, the expenditure from year to year. I, I think it's also <coughs> important as the board looks at this uh, list to know that very traditionally, and I'm not, this board can do what they want, but traditionally, um, not every single item on a wish list is obviously approved. Right. And no. Travis talked about, you know, the amount that has, has been forecasted in, but also what do the, the, what does that mean? You know, is it a one-time expense up, up front or does it carry over year after year to our expenditures? Um, I think that we have to be fully aware and prioritize um, what our needs are, um, where we're going to spend our money, and then also we have to look at our five-year forecast. Mm -hmm. Travis has done a great job for 15 years of keeping us very close to where we're forecasting. Is that how long he's been here? Around 15 <laughs> years, yeah. I didn't know for sure. Right? And uh, you have to look at fiscal year 20 and that we're projected $242,000 oh. in the red. Mm -hmm. So if we're able to do a lot of things that make a difference in our district and, and gain some leverage here on our forecast by not spending every dime that is projected, it can help us maybe stretch another year out. As you look at, as you look at when we might possibly open up a new building mm -hmm. and, and when our money, our carryover starts to dwindle because we're in deficit spending, do, you know, when do we want to go back to the ballot and ask for operating money when we're trying to complete a facilities plan that is really our priority at this time? So if we're able to do some of these things and not spend what Travis has um, allocated, I think it certainly helps us on our five-year forecast and it shows our fiscal responsibility as long as we're also meeting the needs and, and balancing the needs with our, our our expenditures. Yeah. Written really what I think if, if we could do tonight before we get into the personnel is, because certainly this is a draft as Jennifer sent it out, there's some more quotes we're trying to get in here. Um, if there was any questions or anything that the board wanted more information on or, or is a must do, quite frankly, if, if, it, if it's a priority, especially as we look at safety, uh, some of these requests certainly mm -hmm. are revolved around uh, safety. Um, line has we've already kind of went through line 66 uh, the new roof uh, the board has actually already approved us to go to bid for that yeah. um, and line 94 I'm sorry line 96 continues on us on our bus replacement cycle which quite frankly is, is if we didn't do that that that, that just kind of gets away from you if you don't stay on that cycle so um, those two items are kind of things that Mr. Hahn and I had already kind of mm -hmm. thought that we're going to be part of the capital budget. Uh, so that, you know, that could do that and you show the mileage on some of the buses. I'm like, if, if, you, if you guys <laughs> would. So just to make sure, I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the schedule. So the in the forecast amount, personnel, 160000 Are there line items above that relate to the 160000 So you just gave the example. Yeah, it was. I. Certified position normally is about sixty grand. Okay. This so, so the, okay, because right. but for example, you just gave but two, Matt, there, the there new is. roof, the it, new roof, and the <laughs> the uh, one hundred fifty four two fourteen. I assume that amount, given the one we already approved you, or right. was already right. approved to go out. So those two would be included in the six thirty. Is correct. that a fair yeah, statement? Correct. Yeah. So okay. so. You, Right out of the gate, we're 50% down yeah, on the, the capital. On the capital. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. I, I mean, what might help is is if there are other items like that mm -hmm. to highlight those or, or yeah. yeah. So I know. So we know. Exactly. Oh, these are in already. Right. 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 So oh, okay. we're already now, cut in half. 
Exactly. Yeah. And, when, and when we bring the list for you to approve, we'll have that. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. good. Um, but yeah, if you look at like personnel, there are several requests here. Mm -hmm. there, there might be some ways that we can meet the need with one position that that d does a couple of things that's being requested. And I, I, I want to talk about that when we get into uh, personnel here in, in a minute. But um, if you would, if Stacy and Matt and, and Rod, if you would open up your email and Mark open up your email. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, or look at look on to my email here. It wouldn't even open at home. It's earlier today. I don't know if Travis can turn this on so Mrs. Grody pictures. can see. I, I went up and took some pictures on the roof uh, yeah. of the roof this past week. And Travis he wasn't here, but Mrs. the Grody roof was done somewhere. twenty years you can look ago. Online if you want. So oh. And it was a twenty year warrant. Yeah, twenty year roofs usually don't now keep 20. in mind in our facilities plan, phase two <laughs> involves away. keeping <laughs> Well, and Travis has turned it on here. Oh, yeah, I yeah. saw the picture, yeah. Oh. But, but it's okay. Go for it. Let's show. In our facilities plan, this is a part of the high school that we want to keep. Yeah. Okay. The first so, attachment, right? Yeah, you, you can actually click on all three. But this is a dry day. That's a dry day. And the, you can kind of oh, see the drains. Day. Yeah. The water oh. cannot get to the drains. So you walk down the hallway right now, and you'll see yellow caution signs and a bucket here or there on certain days because water is getting through. This roof is sagging. Um, I, I don't think this is something – I hate to spend the money, but I don't think we can avoid addressing this much longer. No, I don't think so. Especially if this is a part of the building that we would like to use. Yeah. In the future, so there's a drain over there to the left, and uh, there, okay. it's kind of off the screen actually. I did, but okay. my point is, it's in bad shape. Okay, I, yeah. I just wanted you to see it. <laughs> that's but that is a different view. We didn't get this view before. We had the aerial view from yeah. way above. Okay, yeah. That's more cost. I mean, I just want to know what more, more cost is it from the ground we where it's sad? The old flat roofs weren't sloped appropriately. The insulation underneath the roofing settles. But the drains don't move. The drains stay. But the rest of the material sags. So I'm hoping when so they, they – Travis, I don't even know if Tony's done the core sample yet on it. Mm -hmm. But my, my concern is if they would tear that off and the, the structure part, the, the wood part or sheeting is in such bad shape that – it's more than it's a roof replacement, not just yeah. a roof yeah. <laughs> repair. I mean, that's or a pond. Co you know, yeah. that's a pond. Yeah, yeah. So it's. I just wanted to show you that that's a. You know, Travis has built in like two hundred twenty thousand, two hundred fifteen thousand, and that's based on a previous quote from maybe a year or two ago. So we're looking at out of that capital six hundred thirty minus two two fifteen right away. You know, and even if something happened and we don't pass a bond to shoot, that part of the that building is going to be used for the foreseeable future. Yeah, right, right. So, all right. Are there? Uh, I'm just curious. Are there items I know that like the PTO and different organizations help with some? Are, are they ever aware of some they, of they these help, items? They actually like help with the technology. They boosters. help with technology Tech quite a bit. Uh, we don't typically put booster projects on here. I know the athletic boosters is kind of wanting to take a little bit of a break away from some of the capital projects that they've done with the concession stand and stadium mm -hmm. entrance. Um, we we did talk with them a little bit about a press box uh, out here at the stadium. And their meeting when you after you left, they did say that. They might help some. They aren't going to take. Yeah, I don't think they will. They're going to take the lead on. They're not going to take the lead. Yeah, I think they they've spent quite a bit the last couple of years. Yeah. Um, they want to finish paying off the concession stand right now. Um, you know the uh, the track. Um, we're going to have to make a decision sooner or later on the track that that needs resurfaced. Can we squeeze another year and, and repair some areas? Maybe. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying that's a priority. Please don't misunderstand me. But that's another two hundred thousand yeah. dollar right. project. Right. right. Just so kids can even have a track team. I yeah. assume if it's so that bad. So if the board wanted to say, right, right. if we proposed and you guys agreed, if we wanted to say, high school roof, lease purchase on three buses, and a track, right. that's all we improve in capital because we just don't have the money. Right. We nickel and dime everything, and this is a great example of mm -hmm. not having permanent improvement money. 
So now, if the levy passed, Travis, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong, we start collecting well, in 2019. We start collecting about a year from now. You can, if you have a project that you want to do, you can borrow against the future future the revenue, an, an, revenue anticipation notes. Okay. So, um, so, so if you had a so in May, you, you could would have an idea. Yeah. Uh, well, we would know. Yeah. One way or the other. Yeah. It, it, now it's going to be hard to do major projects, Not making a decision that late. Agree, but you, know, right, right, you would right, right. know it may. Yeah. Yeah. But even Can if we, we had to spend it, we knew that we were going to recoup yeah. some extra. Sean, would the builder have, have this completed when this finalized? Well, before they or after the. We, we kind of want to talk about some of these things, and then Tra what Travis and I wanted to do was kind of highlight what we wanted to recommend. Okay. And, okay. and then bring it back to you kind of for questions, comments, no's, yeses, approval, disapproval, that Tonight. kind of thing. Uh, at the probably the, the, the March planning okay. session, okay. and then have it approved in April. That gives us time to get we have to bid it or right. Or we have to create new positions. <clears throat> stuff. So, um, what, else, what else here under the? Uh, so that mower is that just for that uh, the tech guy to drive? Throw that out. Yeah, yeah. we that. asked. We specifically asked him about that. They um, they get used a lot. I mean, they're the. There's a lot of a lot of grounds and whatnot, but uh, they, we purchase them, right? Yes. So really, that kind of leads us into section three, I think, because okay. look at the personnel side of the wish list. Um, for okay. year. Enrollment. Um, we we provided a few different uh, handouts on enrollment. One would be the most recent February board report showing 1,972 students. Mm -hmm. Resident students increased by 79, but we decreased our open enrollment last year by 31. Um, Travis also has enrollment figures built into his five-year forecast, and it's important to note that Travis, on this graph here, I'm sorry, on this graph here, um, there, Travis has it on the screen. That number for prior year actual estimated enrollment that is the October count. So that is where we would be in October of 2018. But as you can see, based on our February enrollment count, we're kind of already there at 1972. Okay. Um, I, I think that as we look at this and then we look also at our projected enrollment uh, for the um, Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, I was at a conference today up in Columbus and talking with them about these projection enrollments. Historically, they've been within three to four percent over a 10-year period. I worry sometimes about these projection reports, um, but if they're within three to four percent over 10 years, we're, we're, get, we're probably going to be okay. Yeah. Um, That's their projection about 2019 for us? No, no, no. Oh, this, wow. is, this is Travis in his five-year forecast okay. on this one. Right. I mean, I worry about that because, I mean, I mean, I remember when this building opened, we were already almost at capacity, and I thought yeah. the enrollment numbers were way off. And the, the problem is they don't really, I asked about this, they don't really count, um, they do consider open enrollment, but they don't let it factor in too much because when they do a projected enrollment for a, another district, those same kids could be counted twice or go right back to their home district. So they have to be careful about that. But they, you know, for 2017, 18, they have us at 1962. And it's really 1923 because that counts JBS kids and we don't. Oh, I'm sorry. So they're already way lower. And look at the kindergarten, they're at 130. Yeah. We're currently at 151. Right. And, and, and we're not sure how the kindergarten is going to play out. Traditionally, we've been in the 130s and then we take some open enrollment students. Uh, last year's this this year we obviously had 150 um, kindergartners um, or 147 residents, but we may have to look at and our open enrollment, um, you know, is is an issue we have to closely monitor. And we've talked about trying to get our existing students through, but if our kindergarten registration comes back at 130 or 135 we're going to have to consider some open enrollment students mm -hmm. in that group. Um, we got to be real careful because sometimes we see an influx in first sure. grade because we have all-day kindergarten and some people don't want their kids to go to all-day kindergarten. So I could also see, I could also see the possibility um, of second grade next year uh, accepting a few open enrolled students there as well. We're at 133 right now. Um, you know, financially, 
you know, 140 to 150 is a good ballpark for us, but we've also exceeded that in a lot of our other grades. Um, in terms of how this impacts staffing, high school really is in pretty good shape um, because they, they also lose so many students to the Career Center, right. and they also lose students during the day to College Credit Plus. Um, you know, they're here for three or four periods, but then they'll get in their cars and drive to Hawking or OUL or OU Pickerington, Columbus State, Ohio State. So sometimes there'll be more around 550 in the building during the day. Um, so as far as the education dollars go, do those dollars don't follow that student when they leave the campus, do they? Yes, yes. they do. They do yeah. Right. yeah, that's the rough part about that's College Credit part. Plus. Yeah. It's, very, it's very expensive, the textbooks especially. I know yeah. That part, but it was so I think the primary school, looking at next year, um, you look at you know what Travis has projected on his graph. Uh, next year, if you add up K to two, you're looking at about 445 students. This year, right now, as of February, to have 445, we did add at the beginning of last school year. We added a second grade uh, position, but I don't know um, if we'll be able to absorb that position into another one. Or because right now we're, we're getting by with the modular units we have, the classrooms we have, um, the class sizes, um, you know, we're right around 25. Um, when, you, when you look at six sections, like in second grade. So we'll have to really monitor what we do with the K2, but we might be able to get by with the staff we have and kind of absorb that second grade seventh section into another spot that I'm going to talk to you about in just a minute. Uh, third and fourth grade, um, sometimes fourth grade. Third grade, we did add a seventh section this year as well. So we have seven sections of third grade. Fourth grade, um, the numbers sometimes appear a little high, but what you have to keep in mind is that the gifted intervention specialist pulls kids out of those core classrooms, which drops the number down quite a bit, um, probably three or four students a class when, when they end up pulling the gifted students out for instruction. Yeah. So sometimes that fourth grade can look can be a little misleading, but I just want you to know that, that there is a gifted intervention specialist pulling students out. So when you hear 28 in a classroom, it may end up 24 during instruction because some of those kids are being pulled out. Um, the middle school is something we're going to have to really address. Um, we typically see an influx going into fifth grade, uh, whether it's just because it's a new building or, or what, but Travis is showing an increase of about 17 students in fifth grade and eight in sixth grade next year. Um, and what we do there, just so you're aware, and I, I spoke with Mr. Bratton about that, if you look at the, we've got years and years worth of data about the, the, the mobility factor is what we call it. So how many students do we normally add from fourth to fifth or seventh to eighth? It might be athletic driven, it might be whatever, uh, typically ninth and fifth grade. You see a lot. Um, you know, this year we added 79. Uh, as you look, it again, first grade is normally a pretty big add with not wanting to do the all day, every day kindergarten. Um, so that's the 60 you see there. Um, and again, it's the fall of 18, so this is next year. And then certainly you got to look at how many kindergartners are you adding compared to how many seniors are graduating, because that's a that's a comparison too. So we might not be at 2047 next fall. It could be way off, but just to kind of give you an idea of how we're trying to project our enrollment and base our staffing needs uh, from the projection. I, I think what's clear is that right now, when you look at our current fifth grade, I mean, we saw 10 students move into that grade last, you know, to start this school year. Um, I think one thing we really have to consider is I know in my five years as a middle school principal here and then the high school principal and now in this role, during my time, I don't think we have added any middle school staff in terms of instructional staff. So we've increased during that time about 40 to 50 students over five years in the middle school. And you look at 175 sitting in fifth grade right now. Um, That's the largest class right now. You know, now and, and they, they typically have six sections during the day. I mean, they're looking at 29 students on average in a class. 
Um, now, there's some ways to resolve that. They could get rid of their intervention period, which is almost like a, it's a study hall, but it's not a study hall. They work on AR. They work on math intervention and, and support. They work on uh, getting kids caught up on homework. But one way to e easily help reduce that is to add an extra, get rid of intervention, which is really important to some kids. Yeah. Um, and I'm not talking about um, intervention specialists, like a resource room for, this. Is, it's kind of like a, don't even want to use the term glorified study hall, even though I just did. But they're working on instruction during right, intervention right. period. It's not just for serving students with disabilities, okay? So I'm using intervention uh, loosely. But you take, you take that out of their schedule, and now you spread out the kids over seven sections, and you, know, you just reduce it down to 25 kids per class, which some people would feel is still high, but that certainly helps. One thing that is proposed here, um, I'm sorry, it, it's kind of proposed here. If you look at um, the wish list and you go to the middle school, they don't have a lot of requests, but they did request a general education teacher due to an increased class sizes. And I've talked to Chad quite a bit about how this would work. And it would be a hard position to fill if you ask somebody to, to teach four in the middle school, four academic areas, also do an intervention period, that's a lot to plan for. And it's, it's sometimes difficult to find somebody uh, that feels comfortable, even with a, you know, a K-8 or a 1-8 license, which are some of the older teaching licenses. Even with license, licensing the way it is now. Yeah, most of them now are two subject areas, but we would have to find somebody that would be a 1-8 license. And that, that wouldn't be too difficult, but asking them to do a good job in every core area yeah. when all the other kids have another teacher for math, another teacher for science. Would they have their own classroom or are they going to just have a they cart? Would, no, they would. There's, okay. cl there's classroom space over okay. there. Okay. So what we're, what we're looking at is more of a um, classified staff member to take on, and it also saves us money, but the core teachers get rid of their intervention. They're teaching now seven sections of math, seven sections of science, seven sections of social studies, language arts, okay? But then those intervention periods, this, this new classified staff member, if we propose it to you and you guys approve it, would be doing the intervention periods throughout the day for that grade level to help get the class sizes down, okay? So it's just something, something to think about um, that there's a huge bubble with that fifth grade, but group. the student doesn't get a grade for intervention. They don't. No. They don't. There's no. There's no grading. There's, there's, there's no grading. There's no credit. And the credit thing I think about it, <coughs> it's like I have a couple. I mean, Stacy probably agree too. I mean, like my son and daughter. I mean, they get a lot of homework, and if they have questions, they, they're taking an intervention away. I think it would upset a lot of parents from that yeah. perspective. It probably would. Well, that's right. That's right. So not that one. At some point, we got to do something over here. I think is my point yeah. to help reduce the class sizes, but make it so that it's not too disruptional to the teams, the grade levels of teachers. To have six sections of math taught by one teacher and then one section of math taught by somebody else, they can collaborate and plan, but I guarantee you there's going to be concerns that, well, I've got this teacher for math and this teacher's also teaching three other areas and, you know, maybe they are more comfortable in certain subject areas. So I just think with the um, if we bring this back to you, just know that that general education is probably going to be a more classified staff member to help do the intervention periods, get kids on their math intervention called Moby, Moby Max, uh, make sure kids are doing their, their AR and, and reading, um, making sure that they're working with the sixth grade team um, to find out what kids need support and help and need to get caught up on homework and things. So uh, that would be something that uh, would probably from sixty thousand, I would guess it would go down to about forty thousand on that line item. So, um, also, also under um, as we look at these projections, um, I think we're close. But you know, which one is gospel? It's tough to tell. OFCC believes you know they, they've been very consistent and accurate over their twenty-year history. I know Travis has been very accurate with what he provides every month. Uh, his five-year forecast, he's always done a good job projecting of where we're going to be. So just know, uh, here's the bottom line. We're not going to get any smaller. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we got to figure out where our needs are. Although Amanda did. They got new buildings and got smaller. Yeah. 
but then they have other, other problems too. Right, right. So, um, X number of years of zero for the staff. With, with that, some other things I want to talk to you about. Are we okay moving on to, mm -hmm. to some staffing needs here with the uh, enrollment? Um, so the sixth grade we talked about, um, I, I'm getting very concerned. Um, it's been on my mind throughout the course of the year. Uh, I've seen, you know, I've seen things change in education uh, with the structure of the family and some of the issues students are having as they come to us and some of the support they need. And I'm seeing more and more um, issues in the elementary levels, K to K4, um, with mental health, um, and what I mean is that sometimes um, there's dysfunction in, in the family. Um, the student is coming to school upset. There are issues uh, where the kid, you know, they over the weekend they have a rough weekend um, within their family. They come to school, they bring their problems to school, and I'm talking kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and I see our building principals even in third and fourth grade, dealing with a lot of social issues, not, not behavioral or even academic issues at school. I'm seeing some high level, high functioning students that have some behavioral uh, or, or, or social needs, mental health needs. Uh, they, maybe their family's going through a divorce and um, you know, they, they need some, somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And in the past, we've kind of done, have done this with Katie Wentz, who is our school psych, uh, she's gone out to the elementaries and has small groups, uh, maybe a divorce group. Um, she meets with four or five kids, you know, a couple times a week, um, talks to them, you know, works through some of the things that they're dealing with. Um, and it's impacting the mental health of kids. And we're seeing some types of behaviors and things that uh, don't necessarily need to result in a discipline consequence but we need to get support and maybe some counseling for the student before they get to middle school and high school. And um, I think it's, you know, in a lot of ways, it's a reflection of our culture in our country, just not our school district, but we're seeing more and more of a need for that. Uh, Katie's getting stretched very thin. On the, uh, on the wish list request, you know, there's some help under special education about some ways that the special education department is asking for some support. Which but number, what I which talk, number is it? It's, it's I, line, I line items 21, 22, 23. Okay. 21, 22. Yeah, and, okay. and some of these things. Um, What's up with 52? Because you got the guidance counselor over there with the intermediate. Well, I'm sorry. You got guidance counselor for shared with the primary under. Yeah. Two. So, so what, one thing that I uh, would like to see, and I saw that the principals actually requested this, um, with this mental health component, the social emotional needs that students have, um, it could be very beneficial to not only the special education department and freeing up Katie a little bit, but if we looked at a school counselor, K four. Right. I was just going to ask. And we also, don't, we don't have that, right? We don't. Now, our middle school and high schools have counselors. Right. Okay. But there's a lot of elementaries that do have school counselors. Mm -hmm. And our principals are getting tied up a couple hours a day sometimes dealing with just emotional needs. And then we're relying on Katie Wentz, who is dealing with a student maybe in the middle school or high school, um, or maybe doing an ETR or IEP meeting somewhere, maybe even out of the district. And we have. Um, you know, buildings over here in Inlithopolis that principals are sometimes getting tied up that we're, we're trained, but we're not necessarily guidance counselors. Uh, we're not licensed social workers or mental health therapists. And I, I think to look at a position that would kind of entail a K-4 counselor that would become a K-5 counselor someday, I think when we go to a new building, mm -hmm. if we can get there, we're definitely going to need a counselor for yeah. K-5. Um, you know, they're both both sexes, boys and girls are. We're just seeing a lot of things at a younger age now that they need to um, be coached on. And um, th I also think that this position needs to involve a licensed social worker. So we're kind of one and of the same, all right. But th they would do basic counseling. I'm not talking about scheduling kids like at the high school or middle school. I'm, I'm just talking about more of that support, connecting with the families. Um, reaching out for services within the community to 
to bring people in, but we're already contracting with New Horizons Mental Health for I think $12,000 a year, and that is scheduled for one day a week, and we cannot schedule when kids have meltdowns. No. You know, no. it just happens. And, you know, a student will get off the bus and will get radioed that there's an issue on the bus with the student early in the morning, you know, 8 o'clock in the morning. And for the principal to try to get the school day started and deal with that and nobody else is available, it's an issue. And we don't want to turn around and suspend that student. You know, if at that age, if we can work them through it, get their family involved, so provide the support and structure um, that their family needs to help that student and that we can also do at school, provide that support at school. So what would you do? What would, how would you post that? Would you post it for a, quote, guidance counselor or a social worker? Count both. Both? Okay. Yeah, try to get a counselor and a licensed social worker. Uh, if we could get somebody with some mental health and crisis prevention training uh, or require that, that would be good as well. Um, but we would really want them to work with social agencies and the family to, to connect them to the school and make sure that those kids are, you know, it, it may t sometimes it takes an hour or two to get the kids regrouped to get them back into the classroom so they can learn. And that's better than just having the parent come in and pick them up and now they miss a day of reading and math instruction in kindergarten or first or second grade. And then they get farther and farther behind. So I'm just seeing more of a need in the district. I'm not saying it's a... Um, you know, it's worse in other areas, so I don't want you to think that we're, we're unique, but no. I don't think we can continue to ignore that. We need to support the special ed services a little bit more. We need some social work help. We need some counselor help in our K-4 building. So, I, But I you're right, they wouldn't be doing any, any scheduling because no. everybody's taking the same. That's right. They're, they're just scheduled in, in clusters from one grade level to the right. next, but um, it would be more of that special ed help, social services, um, getting kids regrouped, you know, that dialogue. So that, that's something that I obviously wanted to uh, talk to you well, about. Well, you could always dump it on the school nurse. And, 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 and you know what? So, and, and sometimes, <laughs> sometimes that is happening. Oh, I don't right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it really pulls from everybody a little bit where they're not able to do their job effectively well. in every right. area. Right. All right? Yeah. Um, and I think it's something we're going to need if we pass it. a bond <laughs> issue anyway. So... Um, the, the other uh, area I wanted to talk about is safety and um, mm -hmm. things happen, the unfortunate things happen, uh, there's never a good time for them to happen, but it, it always makes you re-examine. I've had some emails and questions from parents even prior to the incident in Florida this past week, but I want to update the board and let you know what we do um, and what we're, we're doing and what I want to propose to you. Um, we have in the community is hopefully hearing me say this and will hear me say it more in the next two months, but we have some serious issues with our current facilities and safety. Uh, people walk directly into our hallways when they're buzzed in. They're not buzzed into a safe, secure area right. where they don't have access to students. Um, we, have, we have put in cameras and a buzz-in system at our primary, intermediate, in high school. The middle school is a new, newly configured building, uh, design building, that you enter into a vestibule where, that is not open to the hallway, that you have to come into the office. Right. They, so they don't have a buzz in, but you can also physically see right. the person in your, coming into your building. Um, they, you know, we, this has been a discussion here for, for years, going back to when the old junior high was out here and kids used to go from the old junior high and walk all the way across the parking lot to the high school. Um, right. But now, you know, they got to walk, you know, 100 feet in between the buildings, and they do that every 40 minutes throughout the day. Um, I know it's a concern. Um, the kids, we have kids on the playground during the day. Any school does, you, you know, and, and those, those are obviously areas that traditionally we haven't thought about, and we're not going to stop kids from playing. But kids being outside, um, it's important to try to minimize that, except for their playtime and learning time. But we're only able to do so much with our facilities right, right now. Um, and with modulars, there's only so much you can do yeah. when, you're having, when you have 16 modulars in the district. But I think we have to look at what we can do. And we're not a district that has uh, traditionally had major problems where we would need a police officer every single day in our school. There's times throughout the year as a high school principal that I would have to call the sheriff's office to come in and do a report on a drug offense or a knife, um, which would be like a small pocket knife in our experience here. Um, 
you know, you, you would have uh, maybe a theft that you needed to file a report on or, you know, an assault randomly that happened once a year or sometimes not even every year. Um, so I'm not saying this person uh, would, would be um, used in the office every single day, but I really want the board to take a good look at a district resource officer, um, which would travel, would be here primarily throughout the day, and then also would travel to the um, intermediate school as well. I've talked with Sheriff Phelan a little bit about this position. Would be somebody with, with uh, police experience? Yeah, it, it's, it's a deputy. We, oh, it's a deputy. Okay. Yeah, it's actually. I don't know if you want to go that way. Or it's not. actually a deputy, and I wanted to share this with. Because other districts have somebody who has some experience that way, but isn't right. Isn't a, uh, deputy but or you know, we officer. we are not able to right now. If we lock down those doors in between the buildings, there are kids that during class have to go to the nurse. Mm -hmm. So if we just had them on three-minute timers, where only during those three minutes that they interchange for class, that they were unlocked, um, it's not that simple. No. Because we have kids during the day that outside of during normal class time they also have to go back and forth right high school kids come over here for choir um you know we have uh, eighth graders that go over there for foreign language ag home ec um you know several classes throughout the day health even so it, it, you know we try to secure our facility the best we can but we if we invested and put uh, new doors in and those buzz in buzz out systems we would almost need somebody to monitor those doors and just sit there and look at a camera all day and buzz those kids in and out and determine if that's a kid you want to allow access through if we shut that down kids would have to walk out front on the sidewalk between the middle school and high school and that's an issue as well but one thing i think we can do and it's not reactionary to the events that happened but I just think that it makes parents feel more secure, and I'm talking as a parent a little bit. Um, it makes parents feel more secure. It makes our staff feel a little bit more secure. To have a school district, not a school resource officer, but a district resource officer assigned to this campus and also checking in with Lithopolis, they would be issued a cruiser. They would be a sheriff in uniform, okay? okay? Having that car there, having that person walking in our buildings, talking to our kids, getting to know our students, being in the cafeterias, walking down the hallways. Uh, he would be a fully licensed, dressed, um, armed deputy. Um, I don't know if it really ever stops a mentally ill person from coming in and, and doing bad things at a school, but over the last 20 years, mentally ill people that wanted to harm people, whether it was in Las Vegas or in a school, they, they can do it. They can do it. So some of these schools have had resource officers and they have had security in place. And some of those people were killed in these incidences. Right. And it didn't stop people from being killed. But I think it also, with our situation, with our buildings and our doors, to have somebody there between class changes as almost an armed guard, you know what I mean, may present that we are a little bit safer than what we currently are. And it may stop somebody that's mentally ill from, if you know somebody in here is armed, it, it might shoot back. Mm -hmm. Is that gonna stop you from going in and committing such an act? Yeah. I don't you know. You would hope, but anyway. You know, the, the issue, I, and I know this is a heightened conversation and people very sensitive to this right now. 98 students, I believe, have been killed in the last 19 years in mass school shootings. But more parent or more children have been killed over the last 19 years by their own parents. More kids have been killed by lightning. You know what I mean? So, but, but I say that in the fact that I think people, when their kids come home and you have these events going on, they say, what is your school doing? What do they talk to you about? How many drills have you had? Do you know what to do if that ever happened at your school? Right now to be able to put a resource officer out there that's in our buildings and visible on our grounds throughout the day. Um, and the cost is? And the cost is $60,000 a year. We would pay the salary for nine months a year. The other three months, they're, they are reassigned within the Fairfield County Sheriff's Department. Um, there's some nominal fees, like they could get bill us a flat rate of $1,000 rather than mileage every day. They would just bill us $1,000 or $2,000 for the year for mileage for that cruiser to drive between Lithopolis 
to the intermediate school as long as it's over there. How do you for, how do you foresee? And I've, I've never been through the hiring of somebody that did this. Mm -hmm. Certainly, in Amanda. Yeah. But uh, but uh, so if we bring this person in, we, if we all you know majority mm -hmm. of us agree to do this. Mm -hmm. So do you get do you get to interview? We do people. We're involved with the sheriff on the selection process. It's t it's always somebody that is a veteran because you want somebody in a school that knows what they're doing, and then they hire the sheriff's office hires usually somebody green to come in and work for the sheriff's office if you pull a better in a way okay so the current districts right now canal winchester pickerington lancaster and fairfield union have school resource officers um just one for the district just one for the district okay. yeah and, and a lot um lancaster and pickerington they travel between schools fairfield union i think is assigned to the high school but it would cost us sixty thousand plus a thousand or two. I have an example of a contract uh, that the sheriff's office has signed with another school district. Um, you know, the staff has asked me some questions, what we're looking at, what we're doing. I said, I got something I need to talk to the board about. I've talked to Sheriff Phelan. Uh, he says it would not be something difficult to uh, implement. Um, I, the sheriff's office would come in in March if you guys wanted to hear directly from the sheriff's office at a planning session and they could present yeah, right. about how that works. The only question, the real question I have, like, and of course it's just from Groveport, because that's the only place I taught other than mm -hmm. teaching the convict, the youthful convicts at the Fairfield School for Boys. But one of my former students became, a, several of my former students became police officers, either at Madison or Groveport, and they were a resource officer. And they knew how the building was set up and blah, blah, blah. But I think the school district finally had to ask Madison Township to, you know, take that person out and bring somebody else in because he was really getting too friendly with the young women. Okay. Well, I mean, nothing yeah, happened and that, sexually, but the contract it, it be, sure didn't look. I mean, if you looked in the office and saw how he was, you know. The just, con oh, the con if we have like, concerns oh like that, we would obviously go back to the, um, the supervisor, um, Gerald, that's why I was concerned Perigo. if you got a chance to yeah, do that. And, and you can an terminate interview. that contract as well within 30 days. Okay. Um, that's typically how that's done. So if we ever needed to, um, I, I just. I assume they're treated no yeah. different than a contract yeah. employee. Yeah. Saying, What's that? And they're no different than a contract employee. I mean, if you that's have right. an issue with one, right. you're yeah. going to remove them. Yeah, yeah. The, the one thing I'll add into this, and just knowing some of the research on, on these school shootings. A lot of these individuals are coming in while the kids are at school in class. They just didn't go to school that day or whatever, and they're coming in mm -hmm. while they're in right. class. Yeah. And I'm just thinking, I, I think of that. This guy, last guy, came in at the you end know, of the day. And the kids want to know, especially, I mean, especially if a high schooler or a middle schooler is having issues, yeah. they're going to know when those class changes are. That their they doors are, are unlocked. Sneak so back in. If the they back, really want to know, there's cameras them. there. Yeah. Built around that. But if you have a resource officer there. Park that so, car there. It's a different maybe change of mind. So, and, so, and, we, and we know, we hope that our facilities plan will address this, but do we not do anything until then? Or, right. you know, and, and, and that's a major issue that when we go out and talk to the community about why we need these schools, safety is the primary issue and the fact that we're going to continue to put students in modulars. We cannot stop that they have to go into the buildings from yeah. their modulars. Um, you know, I, I think right. some things we need to look at on this list is the second grade modular doors. Um, do we put a card swipe on? Those are five or six thousand dollars. You know, is security going to be a priority for us? Um, are we going to spend five or six thousand dollars to secure those second grade doors with a card swipe um, for the modulars? Um, are we going to look at a school resource officer if we can't lock some of these doors because of the amount of traffic flow during traffic, the day? Right. Is it better off to have an officer monitoring that during the day every forty minutes? Um, I just I think that these are things that we're really going to have to consider. So, it, you know, we can probably get by the way we've been getting by, but I, I don't ever want to put a price exactly. on kind of playing safe and sorry. I mean, at the end of the day, or a staff member. So sixty thousand dollars, and if we can absorb okay. the second grade position, it almost pays for itself. Yeah. You know, we already have that built in. But I kind of I see some. Mental, I don't want to wait till middle school and high school to address social, emotional, and mental health concerns with students right. either. I don't either. Um, you know, some other departments may say, "Gosh, I need help too." But these are areas that uh, impact a lot of the requests that we're seeing here for staffing. It helps in several areas. Yeah. 
and I, I think it's more cost effective. And to add to that, I mean, everything that you're talking about from a guidance counselor, getting the New Horizons person, I mean, if you look at all these school shootings, these are people, the troubled individuals, yeah. from a mental right. perspective, if you can... Right. Get them early. Oh, exactly. You know? it, it makes sense. And, and, I'm, and please don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we have any student um, at this time that has ever. Because you saw the email I sent. <laughs> yeah, we have not had any student that, you know, we are concerned curious. about at the level yeah. that we're seeing nationally right now. Mm -hmm. If we would, we would notify the, uh, the police and law enforcement immediately. Um, just, just a few things with staffing that I wanted you to. I even called again about safety because my computer, like I said, wasn't working right. I thought, well, you know, I could just call Jennifer up and say, and she said you were away at a meeting. And I said, if he's gonna, not going to bring up safety, would you please bring up safety again yeah. at this meeting? Today? Other things we're doing right now, just so you know, I have a, uh, I'm going to, a meeting with the uh, principals um, on Friday for an instructional leadership meeting. And um, part of that's going to involve, we need to talk about some safety things too. We, you know, just right now with everything that's going on, we're getting some questions. Uh, I may put something together in one of our newsletters just to let parents know what we're doing, what we do during the school year. We have safety drills that we, you know, the lockdown drills uh, that take place. You cannot simulate. There's People have mixed opinions about the full simulation of an active shooter in your building and the trauma it causes on little kids when you go through those drills. But you do have to talk with them about if these situations happen. You had an intruder in your building and you were told to go into a lockdown. Do you know what you would do? The other things we're doing, on, on Friday I'm going to talk to our principals about that, but I want them to conduct another drill next week, um, another lockdown drill in their building. Uh, I want them to review the procedures with their staff, but we've all, we are in compliance with the state uh, requirements. Uh, we're, we're probably beyond that with the number of lockdown drills we have. Um, the district did purchase um, these devices, it's called a night lock. Um, that was a very interesting. Night video, lock lockdown. It goes on the back of a door. The door comes in, it goes on the back of the door. There's a plate that this goes into right. on the bottom, and it secures the door beyond the lock. And the district has purchased these. These have all been installed in the middle school and high school classrooms. With the um, school shootings over the last 20 years, um, the majority of them have been in high schools. Right. Okay. Um, you have Sandy Hook and things Sandy like that, Hook. where it was in elementary. But we got the we got this building done. They started working on the primary school this morning. Um, it's very it's very labor intensive uh, work. But I was, that has it was so effective done. in that video. The video yeah. shows yeah. this guy with a sledgehammer actually getting a hole in the door above where the knob is. Minutes minutes later, and yeah. this thing, this this gadget, this. Yeah. was still holding the door shut. I mean, yeah. the guy would have had to They're very scream simple. down to nothing to get right. through. And then there's a tool that somebody would show the administrators that. and law enforcement have that goes under that you had to, you got to pop it up to get the pin out. Okay, right. so um, I just want you to know that, and, and parents need to know, and I wanted to talk about this kind of on the record, that we, we have made an investment. Mm -hmm. These are $50 each. All the primary school will have them installed. The intermediate school will have them installed. They're already in. As of Friday, their last Friday, they were finished up in the middle school and high school. If you get questions okay. in the community, yeah. we will be practicing additional lockdowns. We have practiced those throughout the fall as well. Every building is in compliance with our lockdown procedures. Okay, okay. in this building, since, since it's new and all, what do we have as far as gates that somebody couldn't get through? Don't we have some kind of a gates? Gates are a thing of the past. past the right. fire, fire, the fire chiefs and mm -hmm. state they fire don't. marshal's office is really uh, you can't really lock those. Okay. Um, there, unless you, you have a clear visible exit. We do have one at the uh, primary, but it's not up during the day. You know, those, it's kind of a night kind of gate. Night deal, yeah. But like I said, we have the new, we have the cameras and the buzz in system. But once you look at, the secretary looks at the camera and buzzes somebody in, they're in our hallways. Right. They're not in our office. You know, they, they have access to the students in the to hallways students, now. Right. So new facilities are designed. Um, and this is a beautiful building. I would imagine that our community and in our design process, um, we will probably not design a cafeteria and entrance where 600 kids sit behind glass all day. Right. The daylight is a major feature of new buildings to have natural light. Um, I but think it has to be in the right location though, but we have 600 students a day sitting behind glass that I can see from the stop sign. Right. You know. And a high powered rifle starts. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's some things that we could change and and address in that development uh, process and hopefully we get to work with our community and architects on some of the newest design features for school safety. That's kind of where they start now, not as an afterthought. 
So. Um, yeah, the only thing I would add in this building is, I mean, I've walked in, I've seen somebody let somebody in in this building without even asking who it is. I mean, yeah. at least being somebody able to from ask. outside. Yeah, or? yeah. yeah. I mean, oh. I, every time I see it, it's just whoever's sitting at the desk just buzzes the per person in. The thing I like about over here, it's like at least they ask who it is. Yeah, the audio. From that perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, those are some of the safety things. I just want to make sure you, you were all informed if you get questions in our community. Uh, if you want me to put something in our next e-newsletter, just I a short that would yeah, probably be good. That I can do that. allay some concerns. Okay. And then, um, you know, I will continue to do some informational videos um, about our just fact-based, informational-based, um, about, our, about our facilities uh, issues. Um, I've got some that are done and every couple weeks we're going to put a new one out. We're try, we try to keep them under two minutes and just let people know, you know, what is the facilities plan? Um, you know, we talked about why we believe we need an elementary school at this time. What are the benefits of addressing it in a two-phase approach? Um, talk about location, uh, what people are actually voting for in May. People, what I'm learning is that people seem to listen in short segments, but they won't read anymore. You know, so if you can, I got a friend that said even <laughs> even the emails that he has sent, unless he tells her joke, let's excuse joke. He yeah. reads a, he reads the the header and then he reads the last sentence. Yeah, I said shame on you. Well, if but people, he never reads a book anyway. If but I people mean, can click on a video and listen for a minute, they'll do that. But if they have to read for two minutes, oh yeah, and if you have to give them more than a page, even if it's spaced out, it's like well, forget it. Yeah. There's a back to it. That's not going to get very important in the first sentence. So, so we will, uh, I'll be continuing to put information on our website. We've got a, a really uh, great group of people outside of school doing the levy committee, uh, planning and organizing. Speaking of that, there's a subcommittee meeting on Tuesday at uh, DOS Caffeine House. Are you going to yes. be at that? Yes, on Tuesday, okay. yeah. Okay, now I want I want a little further direction. because Those are the I'm chairs. The, I'm the golden ager. Yeah, Jen one. Sherman is meeting with the chairs of each subcommittee. Yeah, that's, um, I'm one of those. They're in the planning and organizing process. Um, we, we have raised, currently, we have $12,800. Um, there, there's about five more sitting out there just that we just need to deposit. Um, so we're going to be, the levy committee will be in good shape with signage, um, mailers, printing costs, those kinds of things. But Jen has got a ton of energy. They're looking at doing a rally um, to kick it off like March 25th, 24th, somewhere in there to yeah, have I'm a wondering about that community too. kickoff rally and then start passing out signs. But again, what we don't, what I've had to, I've kind of had to harness things a little bit. Um, you don't want to be campaigning for 10 weeks. No. Or, I mean, when she said, or you, maybe you should have a meeting before this committee meeting, I thought, but why? Yeah. In a way. I mean, so maybe I'm being... All the, all the consult, levy consultants, which we haven't hired, um, all, the levy, <laughs> all the levy consultants, uh, successful districts, even political campaigns, um, depending on what level they're at, six weeks, five to six weeks That's beforehand, about it, yeah. and just blast them And I've worked on enough of those doing stuff for some yeah. Is what, we're, yeah, yeah. Is what uh, they're yeah. going to do. So um, I'm, they're asking me questions. I'm answering questions. I'm, you know, obviously involved, too. So... Uh, just want to let you know kind of where that stands. I think the rally could, maybe there ought to be a couple rallies, one there and one at, one at the intermediate. Yeah. I mean. We're going to do you know, building tours in April to tour the elementary facilities. Uh, we'll have an information night from the district that we'll try to get people to show up. When do we have our meeting at, at uh, the intermediate? Coming up, isn't it? Is it before the, isn't it before the vote? March. It's March. March, okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're going to... Maybe we should have that in the cafeteria. Yeah, we should talk about trying to do a rally <laughs> over there somewhere, but we want to... Obviously, we're going to do some videos too to take, take right. people through the buildings. Before they went to the bath that way. But um, <laughs> right, I just want you to know that they're out there. They're planning, organizing. Uh, they got a good group. They're going to be expanding. And uh, I was just thinking about the teachers that I knew had taught at taught at uh, the intermediate building when it was you know a K five building mm -hmm. or K six building. And I was thinking, well, you know, there's there was a few around that actually live in the district. Mm -hmm. like that, somebody come up to me Monday night. They had our elementary committee chairs or or yeah, well, well, some of the yes, subcommittees have right been over yeah, yeah, with, with their, their group. But Jen, Jen uh, is meeting with the chairs on Tuesday. Yeah, on Tuesday? Yeah, it's Saturday. Sure. Okay. So. <laughs> Where's that time again? Doss Coffee House. Yeah. So. It's like, what, six? Uh, or is it seven? I've got it out. Because you're on one of the... You're on one of the yeah, yeah, I'm on the Golden Age Committee. Yeah. I'm on the fundraising and... Uh, 
golden sneakers. Levy signs. I got the silver sneakers. I've been, seven, I, went, seven, I used it last week. I used yeah. it last week. It's seven o'clock. Like, worked out. Seven o'clock. Yeah. So anyway, I don't have anything else. It's this long meeting, but. Heck of a Longer like, than usually. Hey, yeah, yeah, well, I thought you were going to go through. So the only thing that's what I was going to ask you. I don't know. It, I'm joking. Lately, so on your wish list, are you going to have that next time for things that you guys want to highlight that you You're guys think are yeah. essential? Yeah. For this meeting? I mean, Mark? just just off the top, I mean, high school roof was is going to be a priority. Oh, yeah. uh, Those are great. Pictures. Me, district, yeah. a district resource officer, K four uh, counselor slash social year. worker. Uh, middle school um, classified staff member to help with that class size in the sixth mm -hmm. grade. Um, and then we got to talk about, you know, second grade, do we put a card swipe on? Those are security things that I think we can tighten up right away, mm -hmm. you know, and we got these devices too. But should the levy even pass, we're still going to have to use those buildings oh, we got for two, what, three years, two next, years, for sure? If we pass it, we'll start planning this summer through the following summer, break ground in August, hopefully of 2019. You do a year of planning with your community. Right. Um, it's a three-year process. Yeah. It's a three-year, right? Yeah. yeah. Four, it, it, was, done. it was 40 months by the time we passed it until we this. moved in here. August of 21, we would be moving into a new building. So. so is there any way that if we put those on, I'm not opposed to putting those on, those, those modulars and, and all the modulars, but is there a way to <laughs> Get money back out of them. Is, would would they be reusable in some way? They're they're in pretty bad shape. No, I, I mean the actual. I mean the, the security thing. Swipe. There's a way that the swipe oh, card thing the, could the, be. No. Yes. I don't know anything about no. that. The, okay. the new buildings will have their own systems. Okay. Much better than. What well, I figured that. I just thought maybe it's not as simple as you're putting them out there. There's a lot of wiring and retrofitting that. Yeah, we don't even know quite exactly what we're getting into. So I just thought it might be some other school district that might want. It, it may require modules. it may require new doors. Mm -hmm. um, True. You know things like that. So we'll see. I mean, I, I mean, even at Grove Point, we we were so isolated. The high school was so isolated from mm -hmm. the other buildings, but <coughs> Eastland Vocational right next door, and we had a lot, whole lot of students from Eastland Vocational that came across to take. Mm -hmm. Physics and chemistry right. and the higher math classes because they wanted oh. to be over there, but they came across and they weren't even Grove Port students. Yeah, you know? and yeah. It, you know, so that door where I where I taught was open. All yeah, the things time. Have, things have changed a lot. I just think if there's some areas that we can't tighten up and we can squeeze it in, I think we we ought to do I think it. We need to do it. Yeah. yeah. So, I uh, I have nothing else. I don't think. Uh, yeah, I'm good, Travis. All right, okay. so back to the agenda. Where are we? Adjourn and recess, Mark. Adjourn and recess. <coughs> I'll make the motion. Make the motion. Is there a second? I'll second it. Roll call. Please. Mr. Bratton? Yes. Mr. Mellis? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Uh, Thank you all. All right. <laughs>